And now let's talk about rules of thumb in visualization analysis and design. So when I say rules of thumb, I mean guidelines, I mean considerations. Uh, I do not mean absolute rules to set in stone, um, but things to be aware of as you think about some of the major design issues involved in visualization. So things like when to use 3D versus when to use 2D versus neither one, when to use uh, your eyes versus relying on internal memory, when might immersion help uh, versus not be particularly effective, when to use overviews, how long is too long and waiting for the system to respond to user commands, and which comes first, form or function. So let's start with 3D. Unjustified 3D is a very common problem, um, not just in the news, but also elsewhere. And people seem to have the idea that if two dimensions are good, three dimensions must be better. And uh, that's in general, a very dangerous position to take. So here's a couple of great examples from um, WTF is, uh, which is a great site for dubious visualization examples. Um, and 3D is being used here in a bunch of just wacky ways. Like what's going on with these triangles are, should we be reading off the volume or the area or the height? Um, look, there's these triangles and the, these pyramids in the back that are actually being occluded by the ones in the front. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to actually compare anything head on. So what, surely this can't be a great idea. Why do we have three dimensional random rotated pie charts? In fact, it's the same pie chart duplicated multiple times. The fact that it's not directly on the image plane means it's actually hard to read. So, you know, what are these examples of that we should understand the underlying principles? What, what is going on here? And a key fact to remember is that when we're talking about spatial position being a highly accurate visual channel, that only means planar spatial position. That is the spatial position on a two-dimensional image plane um, that is directly head on to what you're seeing. It doesn't mean depth. So that thing about position, either along, you know, aligned position on a common scale or unaligned uh, position, that does not mean three-dimensional depth into the scene. Uh, and so that is what we have to worry about is the difference between depth and um, planar spatial position. And we can see that again in these um, uh, psychophysical curves about uh, our response to sensory stimuli in different modalities, uh, that exactly nice um, linear response to length is not something we get for three-dimensional depth into the scene. In that case, the exponent uh, dot six seven is a much more compressed response. So what's so dangerous about depth? And the answer is we don't really live in 3D. We might have the intuition that we live in 3D, right? I can actually look around at things. I can manipulate things in front of me quite well in three dimensions, things that are you know, within arm's reach. But remember, if I'm just in the world, unless I've got a helicopter, I'm not arbitrarily moving in 3D space. So I'm highly tied to, tied to a ground plane because of gravity. Um, and even more crucially for our purposes, we see in only 2.05 dimensions in this great uh, framing from Colin Ware, whose diagram I'm adapting below. And his point is that what you see on the image plane is something we can very quickly get more information about just by moving your eyes. You can see things side by side, up and down, but the only way to see through another object, once my vision hits an object, it can't go past. We can't see through it. You can't see my face now um, because there was an object between your viewpoint of my camera and me. And so the only way to acquire more information about depth if something is in front of you is to actually move your head around it. And so this idea of moving your head um, or your entire body in order to resolve three-dimensional occlusion relationships, this is why we really are only seeing, in, uh, in Ware's words, the outside shell of the world. We see right up until we hit something, um, and then that occludes everything behind it. So in terms of the amount of effort it takes to gather more information, it's dramatically different for moving your eyes around to see different things in the image plane than it is to actually be able to resolve 
those occlusion relationships by moving yourself around. It's a great way to sense depth, what's called motion parallax, but let's think about the implications for visualization design. One of the challenges of 3D is occlusion. Something is in front of another thing and blocking your ability to see it. So of course it's possible to resolve occlusion relationships by interaction, right? If you've got uh, a view like this, you could rotate it, you know, you could move your viewpoint with respect to the object. So you can resolve certain kinds of occlusion problems by changing your viewpoint, but at what cost? The cost is time. It actually takes time to interact and piece together these uh, multiple views that you're seeing into some idea of uh, a true three-dimensional shape. And there's cognitive load because you are comparing the memory of what you saw before to what you see in front of you now. And that's actually something that has high load. So consulting your internal memory is exactly what we're trying to avoid when we're having this direct perceptualization of things. The other big problem of three dimensions for visual encoding is perspective distortion. We lose crucial information. So perspective distortion is the phenomenon that things that are close to your eye look small um, and things that are far from your eye look big. And of course, for this camera, it's the opposite. My hand is now very large. It's right by the camera. And as it goes further away, it appears to be smaller. Now, this is what we need if we want to make realistic looking three-dimensional graphics that simulate the world. Um, and so it's great that we can do that when realism is our goal. But the problem when we're visually encoding data is this completely obliterates these size channel encodings. If we're using a uh, height or a two-dimensional area or three-dimensional volume, that, is, that information is uh, very highly interfered with by this perspective distortion. The, this power of the plane, of planar spatial position is totally lost. Notice how in this um, picture going way back to the 90s, because people haven't been doing this so much lately, by having these uh, height coded little monoliths and having them recede into the distance on this ground plane, we're not able to make any kind of a reasonable judgment about their heights. That power of high accuracy uh, spatial perception is gone. So although I hardly ever say never, um, it's pretty rare that it would be a good idea to have a 3D bar chart. Um, so let's consider, here's a great example from Stephen Few. We see a bar chart and we see these two things happening. There's perspective distortion. Uh, it's pretty hard to compare the heights of those red bars in back. Uh, they're not sort of exactly aligned with each other and there's occlusion. There's a red bar that's quite hard to see because it's hidden by the blue bars. So it's almost always better. Um, I might even go so far as to say always better to facet into 2D uh, for a bar chart in particular. Here we see the example of we're seeing uh, multiple views. Uh, we've partitioned that. Um, and it is much easier to use that high accuracy spatial perception in the plane to actually get these uh, subtle distinctions between bar lengths that are quite easy to see in 2D and quite hard to see in 3D. One other consideration is, can you read the labels? Um, when text is exactly on the image plane, uh, font designers have gone to great lengths to um, use their pixels wisely and have really um, nice crisp fonts that are really easy to read when they're exactly on the 2D image plane. As soon as you tilt them, the ability to, uh, the technical graphics term for this is anti-aliasing, um, it's actually much harder and you are typically gonna have some degradation of legibility of your text. So here's a nice example of uh, what else could you do? Um, if we can't have 3D, what are some of the other options? And the answer is think of something that might involve um, abstractions that are different than the ones you're given. Uh, I love this example from a uh, paper from Van Wyck. And in this, this is their what not to do figure. They said, well, we have time series data. Uh, in this case, it's um, the uh, energy usage in a building. And all right, if we had a single time series curve, maybe we would look at it uh, in a 2D plot and let's just extrude them into 3D, um, put them all next to each other. And well, what can we see and what can't we see from this visual representation? Um, so we've got the hours of the day going uh, one way and then from January back to December. We can immediately see some things. We can see that people are using normal business hours to access this building. Um, in terms of the energy use, because it's very low at night, 
we can see that looks like there's less energy used in the summer and more uh, in the winter. Um, so we're able to see some things, but imagine trying to compare uh, 10, 19 a.m. on February 16th to 3.26 p.m. on November 27th. It's basically impossible. It's extremely hard to make that direct comparison. If we just had two time series curves for those two days, we could do that quite easily. But in this sort of a uh, perspective view, they just, they're not lined up at all. Those are very hard comparisons to make. So what could we do that's different? Well, here's an example of abstracting the data by deriving something else. Um, and as we talk about in the section on aggregation, uh, they computed a clustering hierarchy. They uh, clustered together uh, similar looking shapes um, and then have a proxy representing each of these clusters. And that makes for a much less cluttered uh, view. So right now we're only looking at the top seven clusters um, and we're able to easily see those. And they're, you know, by definition, they're quite different from each other. All the really similar ones were already gathered together. So we've got a really legible difference between these seven curves. And what's a nice way to actually see temporal patterns? With a calendar designed to show uh, temporal structure. And so we have multiple views. Not only did we derive a cluster hierarchy, we have two side-by-side -side juxtaposed views uh, and we're color coding to have that connection between them. So this doesn't even need to be interactive. This is actually having a static linking of the visual encoding where the color of the days in the calendar we can see on the cluster view. And so, well, what jumps out at us? Well, that flat cluster on the bottom, that's mapping to the weekends. This is a Dutch calendar we've, where we've got Monday through Friday vertically and then the two weekend days on the bottom. What else? Well, we see a sort of that top cluster, the tan one, that's a standard day during the uh, winter. Um, we see, aha, there's a, a standard day during the summer that's a bit uh, less than that. Even Fridays during um, the, uh, the summer are even less, that's that green curve. Um, and we saw that sort of a standard weekday during the summer is actually equivalent uh, to some of the Fridays during the winter. Interesting. We can see, you know, the, the blue ones are, you know, days right around holidays where maybe a lot of people are taking additional vacation. And it's notable that there's this one interesting one. There's a red curve that's near the top where it's almost equivalent to a standard day. And then it falls off dramatically a bit early. When we look at the calendar, we see that's December 5th. If you know anything about the Dutch holiday system, it's called Santa Claus Day. You get to leave work an hour early. This kind of thing would be basically impossible to see in that extruded three-dimensional view. Um, so here's a view where we're able to have that high accuracy uh, two-dimensional view, and we're doing something interesting with the derived data of the cluster and the multiple views. So this is an example of how, although at first thought you might think, oh, but I need 3D, you can try to have a more sophisticated data uh, abstraction and think about how to visually encode using some alternatives. And part of what we're talking about um, in this entire tutorial and class is how is it that we can do things beyond simply the first alternative that comes to mind? Consider other ways, other idioms than just the obvious one. Okay, so when is 3D good? It's when we intrinsically need to see a three-dimensional shape. So there are costs to spending the time to actually spin things around, but those costs are absolutely worthwhile if that three-dimensional shape is intrinsic to the task you're trying to do. Here's a nice example uh, of three-dimensional uh, fluid flow where what we're seeing is quite a complex three-dimensional shape and the ability to interactively move the mouse and have the viewpoint update allows us to actually do that cognitive task of understanding that three-dimensional shape. So when you do need to understand 3D shape, then actually displaying that in 3D and allowing full 3D interaction and navigation is completely crucial. Now it is possible to show non-spatial data in 3D. It is possible to justify it and to carefully consider it. Here's a nice example from the New York Times where um, there was constrained navigation, something we talk about in the interaction section. Um, and with that constrained navigation, a bunch of viewpoints that uh, try to help people see the relationship between viewpoints of looking directly down on one of these axes and looking more from the side like we see here um, in order to uh, help people understand 
that how that three-dimensional structure is related to some more uh, traditional 2D views. So it is possible to justify 3D for abstract data, uh, but you do need to justify it. Don't just use it unthinkingly. So it's legit for true 3D data. Uh, be very careful if your data is um, abstract, tabular, or network data. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm in the 90s for 3D, but these days, after a lot of empirical studies have uncovered some of the difficulties with that, um, there's a lot more skepticism. Um, be particularly careful if your data is just points in three-dimensional space. That's actually one of the most difficult things. So beware 3D scatter plots. Think very carefully about whether you need them. Um, and with network data, where you have these points that are connected by links, it can be quite hard uh, to resolve those 3D depth relationships. So those are two of the most difficult cases to handle. So while we're justifying, don't forget to justify 2D as well. Specifically, do you need to actually see the topological structure of a network? Um, because there is a cost to laying out a network in space, particularly if reading text is important. Be aware that once you're arranging nodes in two-dimensional space, where you want to then put labels within those nodes or next to those nodes, suddenly you've got much lower information density than if you were just displaying that text um, without having nodes spread around in space. And it's also harder to find things, to look things up compared to something like simply a linear list of text. So if you need to understand the topological structure, then absolutely it helps to draw that. But be careful to think, does the end user need that topological structure in order to do what they need to do? Um, be particularly careful about visualizing search results, um, document collections, uh, ontologies. Make sure that you have really understood what the end user needs, not just what the developer of a system is thinking about, but what whether the end user needs to understand something like the topological structure of hyperlinks on the web. There was a lot of enthusiasm at one point. I myself got into visualization through exactly that. But these days I'm quite, quite skeptical about whether that uh, is necessary or a good idea. One more principle, um, eyes beat memory is something that I'm alluding to in a lot of these segments in different ways, but it's good to emphasize the principle that because we're trying to have external um, cognition rather than internal memory, anytime you can move your eyes to acquire more data, that's going to be easier to reason about and think about than if you have to compare the memory of what you saw before to what's in front of your eyes right now. And one of the implications of this um, is to be very careful that although it's tempting to use animation and to show if you've got data that changes over time in terms of how it was gathered, well, should I show it with change over time visually? Not necessarily. Um, animation's great if you are making, you know, Pixar or Disney movies where a human has decided to make sure that only one thing is changing at once. It's great to transition between two states uh, with animated transitions. But if all kinds of things are changing everywhere, um, it can actually be extremely hard to keep track of that. So in data-driven animations, as opposed to human-created animations, things get much more challenging. So a thing to consider is an abstraction. Instead of showing change over time with visual change over time, you could use small multiple views, split it into multiple views you can move your eyes between. And what you're doing is you are showing time with space, with spatial position uh, differences between the views rather than showing time as direct temporal change. Another question is when is it worth it to be immersed, to have some sort of um, virtual reality or augmented reality or mixed reality? So um, when is immersion worth it? Um, my own take is that you should be quite careful. Um, when do you need immersion for non-spatial data? If your data is intrinsically spatial, then absolutely, um, you know, walking through uh, something like an architectural simulation of a building uh, or something where you really do need to understand 3D structure, as we just talked about with 3D, then immersion can be very justifiable. But consider whether the sense of presence you get from immersion is actually important for the task. Consider whether you, if you don't need 3D at all, then perhaps you don't need full stereoscopic 3D. So 
Um, be aware that you should carefully justify uh, immersive analytics. Also be aware of the fact that often visualization is not something that you do um, in a vacuum, you're often doing it in the context of other things. So if you've got a workflow that involves, you know, you have to check something in your email, run something in a spreadsheet, look at a visualization, go continue on with some sort of other analysis, um, that might be much easier to do with a desktop than if you've got a full, you know, VR headset on or you're in any other kind of an immersive environment. The other thing to be aware of is that um, often you have a trade-off. Um, often you have to choose between high resolution and immersion. And usually um, resolution is going to be a lot more crucial when a sense of presence is not uh, an important part of the user task. As we've talked about, pixels are precious. They're typically the most scarce resource there is. So think hard about whether you want to give them up uh, for immersion. So in the sort of first wave of this a while back, um, it was extremely hard to justify the use of abstract data, non-spatial data in virtual reality where you're in a fully virtual environment, quite difficult to justify. Um, these days, there's a second wave going on of people that are trying to have augmented or mixed reality, which I think does have more promise, uh, where you really are trying to integrate with the world around you some sort of view of data in the context of the world. Uh, here's an interesting paper about actually using a physical, tangible device and then augmenting that with a display. Another principle. Uh, there's a mantra by Ben Schneiderman that's become um, almost a cliche, and it's a cliche because it turns out to be a really useful guide to think. And that is overview first, zoom and filter, details on demand. You're going to see this written in a lot of visualization research papers, and that's because it's a useful rule of thumb. So anytime you have a data set where you are able to provide an overview, and an overview is a, a summary, a, you know, showing some sort of summary where you're showing all the data at once. If you are able to do that, it can be incredibly useful as a way to help you decide where to navigate to, what to look at, how to change the view to hopefully find a potentially interesting thing, um, and then explore that in much more detail. So uh, this visualization mantra um, is a good rule of thumb. And one thing to be aware of, though, is it's tricky because in some sense, figuring out how to create that overview, that's like a microcosm of the entire challenge of visualization design in the first place. So if you can solve the problem of overviews, you've solved visualization. It's, it's viz complete. Um, but that means it's something to really think about at the start of a project. What could be a reasonable overview that would guide the user towards some sort of interactive choice to find the good stuff, the interesting stuff? Now, in some cases, it's actually difficult to um, deal with that. If your data sets are truly enormous, maybe it's not feasible to create an overview. But anytime you could, you probably should. So think carefully about how to provide them an overview to start with in order to guide them towards the next interesting choice. Another guideline is responsiveness. Um, and so there's been a great deal of work at places like uh, Xerox PARC uh, and others about just what exactly is needed to make interaction feel interactive. Um, and there's three rough categories of visual feedback. Um, and basically, there's less than a tenth of a second. We can think of that as the perceptual lever, level. So for example, if you're moving the mouse, you know, does something light up beneath the cursor uh, as you're moving around ballistically? That's the kind of response you're going to need to make it feel responsive, like uh, what you do has an effect on the software. Now, what we can think of as a, an immediate response is, for example, you actually click the mouse and you want to see something happening. Anytime you involve a sort of Fitz law mouse control thing where you're actually targeting the mouse to a specific place and stopping, that takes your physical control system of your arm a certain amount of time to do. So response, you know, within about a second, that's going to feel like the system is responding well. And then, you know, Maybe some sort of brief task, 10 seconds is a reasonable time. Um, let's say that you know, you're loading data, something like that. Um, if your mental model is that you're doing something heavyweight, people are willing to wait for a bit. Um, 
But if it's going to be much longer than that, you probably want to have something where you can allow them to cancel that action, at least have some visual indication uh, that you're working. So, you know, for example, you know, when you at least the button press should visually highlight to show that you press the button, even if the underlying computational action might take longer than that to do. So to be aware of these three regimes of basically sub-second, one second, um, and some number of seconds as the big categories to consider. And then you can map those to what you're trying to do in a visualization system. So for example, um, when we think at the algorithmic level about what matters from a scalability point of view, you know, let's say that you're moving the mouse around and you wanna highlight what's under the mouse. You might need to think about the computer graphics implications of say, only drawing things for those of you who have a ba graphics background into the front buffer and not re-rendering the entire scene. Um, another thing to think about is if you've got things that will take substantially longer than just a few seconds, either show a visual indication that computation is happening and maybe even allow them to abort. If you're going to do something for a long time, then you know consider actually having separate threads to do that in the background and actually show people how far you are in that computation. And then if you've actually got so many items in the view that you can't be guaranteed that as soon as they move the mouse, something will change, maybe you need to use more sophisticated strategies uh, for actually drawing the items. For example, guaranteeing a frame rate rather than simply trying to draw every single item before going on to the next frame. Now let's talk about form and function. So I would argue that function should come first and form next. And here's why. Um, if you start with something that's beautiful, but not functional, you're just stuck. You sort of hit a brick wall. You can't help. You might have to start from scratch. Um, on the other hand, if you start with something functional, it's definitely possible to refine the aesthetics of that as a next step. Um, even if you personally have absolutely no expertise in graphic design, that might be something where you can actually uh, collaborate with someone who's got some expertise in visual design issues. Um, because visuals do matter, aesthetics matter. Uh, there is a level of function which is, you know, for one thing, people are just less likely to engage and agree to work with things that are flat out ugly. Um, but there's also principles about the use of visual space and visual hierarchy and alignment. And there's a lot of principles of graphic design that come down to guiding people on how to use their eyes effectively. Um, and so, uh, although I'm not actually covering it um, here, the idea of the Gestalt principles of that actually um, are a way to think about how people's visual attention progresses through a scene. Um, these are important issues, but if you have to pick one, it's great to have both, but function first, form next. Don't ignore form, but don't start there because it is hard to keep going. So an incredibly basic uh, idea of some of these graphic design ideas, um, there's a great sequence from Robin Williams uh, where uh, she walks through some examples. So, you know, here is a book cover. What is one idea here? The, the principle of proximity, grouping related items together in terms of spatial position um, means that what you want to do is not just have everything have equal white space between. So here's a pass through that where things are actually um, now gathered. We've got um, the, uh, you know, the, the subtitle is next to the title and then much further below is uh, the name of the author and the date. But what could we still do better? Right now, everything seems to be centered. What if we aligned things better where there's sort of a visual line that instead of having your eye go jagged, having it be straight up and down, that's easier to actually read. Here's an example where it's right justified uh, or you know, left justified is your other option as opposed to simply automatic centering because your eye has a harder time actually traversing. What about emphasizing repetition? If there are things that are consistent, then actually make that more visually obvious. Here we've got the word around in this repetitive motif of the triangle. And then finally, the idea of contrast that if things are not absolutely identical, make sure they're really different, not pretty similar, but not quite. Um, so here's an example of actually emphasizing um, with a high contrast thing. So this is a super brief walkthrough. I actually highly recommend the non-designers design book that she wrote, um, a very fast read. It's quite practical to work through the whole thing. This was just, you know, one of many, many examples from that book. It's a great resource.
while I'm talking about best practices, let me just put in a pitch for labels. Uh, in, um, I'm mostly discussing like visual encoding and interaction issues. Um, but this idea that a visualization can and should be as self-documenting as possible. Um, so, you know, it helps to have a title. Uh, it helps to have labels and legends. So things like if you've got axes, you should label them. You know, often even a, a sub window or a pane, labeling that actually really helps people understand what's going on. You know, think about tick marks on axes. There's entire papers. Uh, Talbot has some nice papers on how to compute tick marks. Um, in general, things that are plotted should have legends. Um, if it's not redundant with the main title, then make sure that you know individual charts actually have useful things. You know, be aware that you know using scientific notation um, on axis labels is rarely necessarily the right answer. So think carefully about in what format should you even put in numbers. As usual, XKCD has guidance for us on the importance of labeling your axes. All right, so I walked through a lot of rules of thumb just now about 3D, um, always justify it. You should even justify 2D, the idea that eyes can beat memory. Um, think carefully about whether you need immersion, uh, if, especially if there's a trade-off with resolution. Uh, Schneiderman's mantra, overview first, zoom and filter details on demand uh, is a great way to think about visualization design. What kind of responsiveness you want in uh, when the system is responding to a user action. And then the idea that both function and form are important, but start with function and then add form if you need to sequence the two.